Now, open your Bibles to the book of Revelation. Not Revelations, Revelation, please, if you would. Chapter 18. Everybody should have a Bible or a Bible open. Thank you. Welcome back. And All right. Now, um, today, it, Pastor Gary makes things sometimes very difficult for me. Oh, oh. So, uh, but, <laughs> uh, but he's awesome. So I have to, I, I, I don't think there's any possible human way I can go through all of chapter 18 today uh, and do communion. So, uh, and he's already got communion ready, so I'm going to probably go a little faster uh, than I normally do, and, uh, and we're going to do uh, Revelation 18, at least most of it, and then we'll have to continue uh, with the rest of it, um, 18 and 19 next week. All right, so uh, where we left off last week uh, and the week before, if you remember, the judgments of the Lord had come and... And uh, he was going through all of his judgments, and the bold judgments were being poured out. Uh, if you remember, uh, as, the, as the last angel poured out that seventh bowl of judgment, you remember that uh, uh, that angel came and, and basically took uh, the Apostle John uh, on a, a little end times tour guide to show what's going on when all these judgments are being poured, poured out, the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, the bold judgments over the whole world. And his, he said, I'm going to show you the punishment of the great prostitute. And that's basically, that's man-made religion and the man-made economic system and under the uh, control of the enemy. And, and he talked about who sits on many waters. You remember that? That's all the peoples and nations that make up the world, the religious, the political, the economic system. And they were intoxicated, you remember, with the wine of her adulteries. And George, I know, thank you. You're going to get that raised up a little bit because we can't see some of that. But anyway, that's basically their sin and their compromise during this time. And you remember that angel carried John away uh, to the wilderness and he, and he saw all the symbolic stuff, that, that woman, that, that prostitute sitting on a scarlet beast covered with blasphemous names, all against God and, and having seven heads and ten hordes. You remember those, that seven heads means the kingdoms that are under the beast's power during this tribulation time. You remember the, the horns is just talking about the, the power and, and the riches of this uh, of this whole world system, this one world religion, this one world system, and she's dressed in purple and scarlet, she's rich with precious golds and gems, and she's drinking in all the sin, you remember that. And on her name, like, like they did the prostitutes of the Greeks and the Romans, was written Babylon, the great mother of prostitutes. And she was drunk with the, the blood of the persecution of God's holy people. But in the end, you remember last week, we talked about they'll wage war against the Lamb, and it's going to look like they're going to be winning for a while uh, for it, during with that period of time. But the Lamb will triumph over them because He is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And with Him, that's you, us, we who have been called, chosen, and faithful, all of His followers. And it says, if you remember, we talked about this, Matthew twenty-two fourteen. many are called, few are chosen that we are called to live a holy life different than the world. We're supposed to look different, sound different. We got to remember that he, we are chosen, that he appointed us to bear fruit of the Holy Spirit, fruit that will last. And it's required that those of us who have been given that trust be found faithful. So God wants to take and stretch us, okay? And then he leads us in triumphal procession so that we can spread the fragrance of his grace and knowledge of him everywhere. And then finally... We saw that the beast with the ten horns, that the, the whole system, world system, that is subservient to the beast and the Antichrist during this time, and they think they're in control of it. It's actually going to turn on them, and all those worshipers, all those people who, who, who took the easy way out to get that, that, the number of the beast planted so that they can survive in this world, they're going to be turned on, and they're going to devour uh, all those who worship them, just well, it's always what the beast does. He offers you something that looks really great, right? That sin is pleasurable for a season, but he always turns on you 100% of the time. It's just a matter of when, okay? 
And we left off with this, Mark 8, 36, 37. That's why Jesus said, for what shall it profit a person to gain the whole world and lose their soul? Or what would you give in exchange for a soul? So as we start in on Revelation 18, well, and, and a little bit, 17, 18, 19, Apostle John's seeing this whole one world religious system collapse, the whole economy collapse, all under the control of the Antichrist. It looked like this salvation. Hey, we've got digital currencies. We've got this. It's going to make it easy for everybody. We'll all be under control of this government. It's going to be safe for all. And it's all going to be this big lie. And, and so it's all going to start to collapse and unravel. And, 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 and this world system is set up to be in opposition to Jesus. It's just set up to be in opposition to his word. So when you see most of the news organizations or most of the entertainment, you know, going one direction, can I tell you? That's usually a good indicator. Not always, but usually a good indicator to go the opposite way, to go towards the cross, right? So this is... So even before this Bible study, you're going to get not only one Bible study, Brett, not only one, but two, two Bible studies in one today. <laughs> so I want to talk to you a little bit about this world, okay? Because I want you to know what the Bible says. The world wants to numb you out. The world wants you to be all inclusive to what they want to do. And God says, no, I want you to do what I want you to do. It's very different. And you're going to start to see it more clearly. Listen, the Bible says this, and this is very clear. And you have to forgive us because some of it's being cut off because of our projector. Uh, got a little bumped a little bit. We'll have to fix that later. But the Bible says, in, and this is in 1 John 2.15, it says, Do not love this world, nor the things that it offers you. For when you love the world you do not have the love of the Father in you. Now listen, when we're talking about the world, we're not talking about, oh, the trees are so beautiful. Oh, look at the mountains. Look at the rivers and lakes. Everybody understands that, right? Uh, William McDonald said something about like this particular verse, and I, I thought it was pretty good. He's a Bible teacher. He says, the world does not mean the planet on which we live in, okay? Nor the world of nature about us. It is the system which man has built up for himself, infused by the enemy, I believe, in an effort to satisfy the lust of his eyes, the lust of his flesh, and the pride of life. In this system, there's no room for God or his son, and it may be in the world of art or culture or education or science or economy or religion, but it is a sphere in which the name of Christ is unwelcome, except, of course, as an empty formality. It is, in short, the world of mankind outside the sphere of the true church. Does that make sense? He, f he finishes with this. Oh, I wish it wasn't cut off. Why oh, it bugs me. Sorry. I'm, that's going to bother my little ADD self, OCD self, the entire... Help me to focus, Lord. Yes, how I feel exactly. It says, to be a friend of this system, the Bible says, is to be an enemy of God. It was this world that crucified the Lord of life and glory. In fact, it was this religious world that played the key role in putting him to death. Remember, it was the Pharisees, right? It says, how unthinkable, how unthinkable it is that believers should ever want to walk arm in arm like with the world that murdered their Savior. Listen, the Bible is very clear on this. I, I realize that the church and the, and the, and the, uh, in, in many places, they want to look just like uh, uh, the world, being and cool and hip and whatever. And you know what? Forget about that. The Bible says, this, this is in the book of James, chapter 4, verse 4, I think. It says, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world means enmity with God? Therefore, everyone who chooses to be a friend of the world, to go along with the, the world system, becomes an enemy of God. Does that make sense? Listen, that's strong. Here's what Charles Spurgeon said about this, and I thought this was real powerful. He said, I believe that one reason the church of God at this present moment has so little influence over the world is because the world has so much influence over the church. Right? Isn't that powerful? And it's true. And it's very subtle. 
And they do it just like the world does it. We don't want to talk about things that convict you. We don't want to give you the whole counsel of God. We just want to give you little sections that are encouraging, little snippets, little cotton candies. And, 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 but in that 1 John passage, and everybody should have this passage underlined. It's 1 John chapter 2, 15, uh, 16, and 17. 1 John chapter 2. I'll, I'll put another verse up on the screen, but that, that do not love the world verse, 1 John chapter 2, 15. The next verse, chapter 16, goes on to say this world, for everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but is from the world. Here's a different way of putting it, and I like this, uh, I think this is uh, the New Living Translation. It says, for the world only offers, excuse me, offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, roses and rainbows and puffy clouds. Get what you want for yourself, right? And the pride of our achievements and possessions. But all that doesn't come from the Father, but are from the world. The reality is something different. Proverbs says it this way. This is, this is powerful. Proverbs 27, 20 says, listen, hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man, and why is it men? No, it's both, men and woman, mankind. Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of mankind are never satisfied. In other words, your fleshly nature always wants more, always wants stuff for me. Does that make sense? And it's never satisfied. Here's what worldliness is, because I want to make sure that everybody understands it, because it, it'll get confusing. Worldliness is whatever makes sin look normal and righteousness, righteousness look strange. Does that make sense? Is that a pretty good definition, would you say? Worldliness is going to say, hey, don't worry about sin. Ah, oh, yeah, don't, yeah. And righteousness, well, you're one of those Bible thumpers. You love the word of God? Absolutely. It's a lamp unto my feet and a light into my path. It divides soul and spirit. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of my heart. I hide God's word in my heart so it won't sin against me. It strengthens me. He encourages me. He empowers me. So worldliness, too, is not, such a matter, not as much a matter of activity, but also of your attitude. Because sometimes we can do all the right things as a Christian, but our attitudes in our heart are bad. So it's possible for us as Christians to stay away from, you know, places maybe we shouldn't go or things, but worldliness is a matter of the heart. Does that make sense? To the extent that a Christian loves the world system and the things that are, that are in it, he doesn't love the Father. So we need to stay away from some of these things. When it says everything in the world, the lust of the flesh in 1 John 2.16. That lust of the flesh, that's the first device that the, the world uses to trap you, okay? And, and that lust of the flesh is anything that appeals to our fallen nature. It's, it's, the flesh doesn't mean our body like this flesh. The flesh is the nature we received from our physical, at our physical birth, our, our desires. The spirit is the nature we receive in the second birth. So a Christian has both the old nature, our flesh that wants what we want, it's all about me, and the new nature, the spirit in his life. And these two battle, they, the Bible says in Romans, they're at war with each other, right? And, 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 and they war within us, okay? And so we have to be feeding the spirit more than we feed the flesh. When it talks about the lust of the eyes, right? That's even... <laughs> That's the second device the world uses to trap you. The, your eyes are the gateway to your soul. And that includes all the sinful cravings that are triggered by what you see. And it leads us to envy or to, to want or to covetousness. And, and, and the Bible says you need to be content with what you have. And we are until we see that somebody's got something better. Do you know what I'm saying? Oh, look at that car. Look at that house. Look at that wife. Look at that husband. Right? Look at that TV. 
Or, or we look at somebody's Facebook image or Instagram thing and you think, oh, wow, look at them. They're putting up all their best pictures like their life is all hunky-dory. Oh, I want that. I need that. And I want more, 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 more. And suddenly the job, our clothes, the church just isn't enough. Well, I want a Disneyland church. I want a, you know, I want a husband that makes a zillion dollars a year. And I want... Listen, the lust of the eyes is just given over to our fleshly wants and desires. And it says the pride of life is the last one. And that's basically, the Greek word for pride just means, and it describes an empty, puffed up bragger. And basically it just describes somebody that's making it all about me. Okay? And always trying to, I need to be respected more. I need to be thanked more. Why, why didn't they thank me? Why didn't they praise me? Why didn't they look at me? Why didn't they, why me, 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 me? But here's what the Bible says in that last verse in 1 John 2, 17. It says, the world and its desires will soon pass away. But it says, that means it's going to burn. Like we're, like we're reading in, in Revelation 17, 18, and 19. It's all going to burn up. Everything that you're seeking, all that stuff is just temporary. It really is. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't be trying to get a better job or provide for your family, right? You should. Don't, don't get me wrong. You know, I need to save for the kids or something like that. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. But when you're making that your goal, instead of honoring Christ, you have got the whole thing backwards. Does that make sense? And I know this isn't a fun word to hear, but it's a word you need to hear because a lot of people aren't teaching it. It scares me. It says the world and its desires are going to pass away. It's all going to burn. You're going to see it even in Revelation 18, if I ever get to it. But it says, but whoever does the will of God is going to what? Live forever. forever. Absolutely. I like what C.T. studied. He was a missionary to China, and he said, and India and Africa, but he said, only one life will soon be passed but only what's done for Christ will last. Think about that. You get up every day and you have that in your mind, you will be powerful for the kingdom of God. So let's start us off in Revelation. Usually I read it all the way through, but I I don't think I have time to do that today. So we're going to go to the first verse. This is Revelation 18, 1 through 3. So it says this. It says, after this, excuse me, after this, I saw another angel come down from heaven. He had great authority, and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. Just can you hit the light just for a second? Thanks. Sorry, forgive me. And that after this is metahoitos, and that just means it's repeated throughout the whole book of Revelation. And that just, God seems to use that to separate sections of John's revelation. And so another angel, it's alos in Greek, and it just means the same kind of an angel we've been seeing, like we saw in 16 when they were pouring out the bowls, or in 17. And it's the same type of angel. And some people thought this was Jesus, but it doesn't say that. It says another angel, one of the same kind. And it says illuminated by his splendor. And that probably indicates that this powerful heavenly angel came from the presence of God. And just like Moses did in Exodus Chapter 34, 29 to 30, he was glowing like the sun. I don't know if you remember that scripture, but it says in Exodus 34 that Moses didn't realize as he came back down the mountain, we had the, the, the tablets of God, that his, he was glowing from being in the presence of God. And, and because of this radiance upon his face, Aaron and all the people of Israel were afraid to come near him because he was just radiating the glory of God. It was just like, oof. And you know what? What I've noticed, the more people are walking with the Lord, getting his word, hiding it in his heart, not just getting it in their mind, but in their heart, the more they're allowing the fruit of the spirit to grow in them. Do you know what I mean? The more they're dying to flesh and allowing the Holy Spirit to, to move and work and have free reign. Let me tell you, you glow as well. There's a difference in you when you do that that people notice. Mm -hmm. And they might even not be able to put their finger quite, you know, I don't know why you're like that. I don't know how, but something's different about you. I I don't know what it is. I'm going to go to you for prayer. 
I'm I, 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 I going to go for you to encouragement. I, 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 what is it about you? And it's the Lord. And so this angel is just like, like glowing, you know, illuminating, right? Verse 2 goes on to say in, in Revelation 18, with a mighty voice he shouted, and, and some of your translations will have this different. It'll say Babylon the Great has fallen and fallen, but it, it says first in Greek, fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. She has become a dwelling for demons and a haunt for every impure spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable animal. Listen, when it says fallen, fallen, and it puts it in that, it's saying this is the first important. This is a deep meaning. That word fallen is, is pipto in the Greek. And it means, listen, that system, the Babylon system, the world system led by the Antichrist, right? That's going in the direction opposite the Lord. It means, yes, it means to fall, it's fallen, but it means more deeply to be thrust down, to fall under judgment or condemnation, to be cast from the state of prosperity or authority, or, I like this one, to be overcome by the attack of an evil spirit, to perish or be lost. That's what's happening to this world system. So right now, the world seems like, oh man, we're going in this direction. If you're not on board, why are you fighting against us? Why is there male, female? Why can't we? Why, 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 why? What, what marriage just between a man and a woman? Why? All these things. And yet, let me tell you, it's all going to come be cast down. It's going to perish. It's going to be lost. So don't put your hope in it. And that haunt for demons and unclean animals, that simply means it's now totally filled with defilement, danger, and demonic influence reigns supreme. Right, if you don't know this, let me tell you, really, because I, I, I run across people who, I don't really believe in spiritual warfare. I don't really believe in demons. Can I tell you something? You know what? You are, oh, good Lord's holding me back. Let me, let me just, thank you, Lord. Uh, you really need to ask the Lord to open your spiritual eyes to see because there's a battle going on around you that you're not aware of. And you need to see it. Oh, that reminds me. Uh, Ezekiel, can you give this to Grandma Sue? This is The Invisible War by Chip Ingram. Try that one, okay? Thank you. I forgot. And that demonic influence is going to reign supreme. After the, you know, Christians are already gone. There's just a tiny remnant, right? They've been raptured. There's only a tiny remnant left. It's just going to be given. Imagine nothing good. Imagine everything. Have you ever been around a selfish, selfish person? I can be selfish apart from the Lord. But imagine it's all about you. You don't care about anybody else. And everyone's like that. Not a world I want to be in. Listen, it goes on to say, verse 3, For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from their excessive luxuries. And that's even, we're seeing the start of that happening even now. You know, people selling out, countries selling out, just, oh, it's, a, it's a bad thing. When it talks about Babylon and the nations, it just means the world system and the people that are, in this time, now led by the Antichrist. It's, it's the people of the world, the craving, Satan's drink of meism. Just focus on yourself like never before until it's imminent collapse into debauchery and destruction. That's what's going to happen. It goes on to say in Revelation 18, 4 through 5, it goes on to say this. And, and, and I love this. You can hit the light for just a second, Chris. Thanks. I love this about the Lord. If we read this revelation, you know that every time God's been, and people are still rebelling. The Antichrist is out, the beast is around, you know, everything is going. And you know what's happening? God is still calling for people to come out and to repent. That's amazing to me. It's, God is so wonderful. I've been like, you know what? You were done chapters ago. But that's not God's heart. It's not at all. He says this, listen to this. John says, then I heard another voice from heaven say, come out of her. In other words, that Babylonian system, that worldliness, get out of there, come out, my people, 
so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues because the judgment's coming. And it goes on to say, for her sins are piled up to heaven and God has remembered her crimes. I love that God is still calling people out. And that word come out or some of your translations would say separate or get away from the word in greek is air komai and it means to come out from a group uh the world the worldly ways actually it means voluntarily or cast out jesus when he would call so you can either choose to do that right or there's going to be a time where jesus is going to force it right you know when Jesus would be casting out a demon and he would say, he would, that, that's the word he would use, Ercomai. In other words, you're going to submit to me when that casts out the demon. So that word, come out, separate, get away from, also means to escape from its power into safety. God is still calling, even though the whole world is going against him. He's saying, I want you to come out of that system. Stop walking with the enemy. Stop walking with the Lord and walk with me. Escape it into safety. Isn't that cool? God is trying to rescue people still that are rebellious, just like today. Can I tell you what? Let me just be honest. If you're here and you're new, I want you to understand that all of us can be rebellious apart from Christ. Just out of curiosity, if you're here and you've given over your life to Jesus and you've really done that, can I ask before you did that, right? Well, even sometimes as we're still, were you rebellious to the Lord? Just give a raise of hand. How many of those? Yes, absolutely. Heads are shaking, hands are up. God rescues sinners. Thank you, Lord. And he's still trying to do that. And he's trying to get them to escape from its power Satan, his demonic forces, into safety in the loving arms of Jesus. That's the only place you'll be safe. You won't be safe with your friends only, with your family, with your job, with your social, with your church. You'll be safe. There's Jesus. He offers you alone as offers you safety. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Right? Does that make sense? Capish? Like God telling the Israelites, if you remember this from the Old Testament, right? Old Testament Babylon, in Jeremiah 51, he told them, right? He said, like, get out of Babylon now because the vengeance of the Lord is coming. Or when he told Lot, if you remember the story of Lot in Genesis chapter 19, he told Lot, come on, get out. Uh, the judgment's coming, right? He's, don't look back. We can do that. Don't look back. It, it, or Moses telling the Israelites, I don't know if, how many of you guys remember this, it was in number 16, but Korah and Dathan, right? They were rebelling against God and they wanted to do their own thing, right? And Moses like ran out there with the leaders. He's like, get away from these guys because judgment was coming. If you remember what ended up happening, the whole earth opened up. <laughs> Swallowed up, baby. He's still trying to rescue. God still cares about the last remnant of people pleading with them to escape judgment during this time. So if you think God is some jerky, mean cop in the sky, you have missed a whole point. I also want to tell you, God still is calling people to come out of the world system right now, today. And he wants you to be a part of that. Listen, this is in uh, 2 Corinthians six seventeen. The world is like lemmings. They're going on into darkness and the world ways and the world system. Everybody else is doing it. It seems right. That's what the media says. That's what the news. I'm just going to keep going. Keep going. That's what the church, a lot of churches say. Sometimes you have to say no. You have to be discerning. You have to have the word of God in you for yourself so that you know. Listen, in 2 Corinthians 6, 17, it says, what agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? It says, for we are the temple of the living God. We're to be different. We're to come out from, from that life, separate ourselves. And that's exactly actually what 17 says. It says, therefore, 
He says, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. Now, here's what that doesn't mean. That doesn't mean I'm walking along and I touch and I'm, sinner! Oh, huh. I, I'm sorry, I don't associate with you sinners because, you know, I'm a Christian. No, that's not God's heart, is it? God's heart is reaching out and grabbing and saying, come on out, brother. Sinner, come home. But he's saying, I want you to live differently than you did before, right? I used to speak this way. I used to do these. I used to go to these places. I'm not going to do it anymore, right? If you get saved and you're pretty much living the same life, something's wrong. Examine your heart, the Bible says. See if you're in the faith. I'm afraid to ask, how long, how long have I been teaching? Ready? Okay, we're putting the pedal to the metal. Revelation 16, 8, 6 through 8 goes on to say, give back to her as she has given. Pay her back double for what she has done. Pour her a double portion from her own cup, this, this sinful cup this, that she's drinking from. And only six times that I remember in the Bible is there a reference made to a double portion? Deuteronomy 21, 17, it's when the firstborn son, he gets a double portion of that blessing. 1 Samuel 1, 5, Hannah got a double portion of love because she was without a child. 2 Kings 2, 19, if you remember the prophet Elijah, gave the prophet Elijah a double portion of his spirit, or at least Elijah asked for it. Job 42, 12, Job got a double portion of blessing for all that he lost during the, 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 the time when Satan's just taking stuff away from him. Isaiah 61, 7 is also a blessing uh, in that millennial reign for Israel, a blessing of joy, a double blessing of joy during that time. All these are blessings, all except this last one, Revelation 18, 6, right here. And it's a double portion of judgment. And it says, give her as much torment and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart, she boasts, I sit enthroned as a queen. I'm not a widow. I'll never mourn. And, and why is this judgment so strong? And here's the reasons right here in this verse. People are glorifying themselves. I put luxuries luxuriates in self. I don't know, maybe self-indulgent might have been a better word, but it, I was trying to highlight self, self, self. But indulges himself, that's what they're all focused on. And enthrones themselves. And we're not to do that. He's on the throne of our life. And we need to act like it, speak like it, live like it. It reminds me in Isaiah chapter 47, verses 10 through 11. This is in the Living Bible. I just thought it put it really nicely. When God was actually bringing judgment on actual Babylon and they were doing all sorts of wicked stuff, he said, that, he said hey, you felt secure in your wickedness. They were the leaders of the world at the time. And he said, hey, no one sees me. And they were so knowledgeable, those Babylonians, and so wise. Your wisdom and your knowledge have caused you to turn away from me and claim that you yourself are God. This is why disaster shall overtake you suddenly, so suddenly that you won't know where it comes from. And listen to this, and there will be no atonement then to cleanse away your sins. When that judgment happens, it's too late. Therefore, it goes on to say in verse 8, therefore one day her plagues will overtake her, death, mourning, and famine. She will be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord who judges her. I know this is a lot of judgment stuff, but this is what we have to realize as well. Revelation 18, 9 through 10 continues. When the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her and shared her luxury see the smoke of her burning, they will weep and mourn over her. Terrified at her torment, they'll stand off and cry, Woe, woe to you, great city, you mighty city of Babylon. In one hour your doom has come. Everything looked fantastic and now judgment, it's gone. So basically the Apostle John now is hearing weeping and wailing from all those who loved and trusted in the Babylonian system and the, 
And specifically, he's going to mention the kings of the earth, the merchants of the earth, the mariners of the earth. And his next verse is John's describing the implosion of this worldwide religious, economic, political empire that's going on during this time, during this tribulation period, and the anguish associated with those who are addicted to that satanic power and self and abuse. It's all going to blow up in their face. It reminds me of the church of Laodicea. They said to, to the Lord, Hey, we're rich. We don't need a thing. And Jesus said to them, Oh, you, you don't get it. You're, you're trusting in your riches. You're trusting in yourself. But you don't realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I, I, I want to have a humble heart. I, I don't like sometimes seeing some of the stuff here, right? But I want to see it. Ask God to show you, right, what's in your heart. Because we can deceive ourselves. We can think, hey, we're good. I'm not like that person there. I'm not like him or her, right? And it's easy to do that. But God's like, no, I, ask him. Say, search me. Examine my heart, O oh Lord. It goes on to say this. Revelation 18, 11 to 13 says the merchants of the earth along with the kings was last verse the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore cargoes of gold silver precious stones pearls fine linen linen purple silk and scarlet cloth every sort of citron wood the articles of every kind made of ivory costly wood bronze iron and marble cargoes of cinnamon spice incense myrrh and frankincense of wine and of oil uh, a fine flour, a fine wheat, and fine cattle, and fine sheep, uh, carriages, and even human beings as slaves. And I want you to think about this too. Notice all these people aren't weeping for the rebellion against God or weeping for others. They're weeping that the money's not coming in anymore. They're not profiting. It's all about me. Do you know what the B Satanic Bible starts off? You know what it says? Do what thou wilt is the whole of the law. In other words, just make it all about you. Whatever you want to do, that's pretty much it for the Satanic Bible. Also notice the cargo listed here would have been recognized by the Apostle John in his day as expensive, luxurious, or commercialism. Even human souls are used to drive engines of prosperity. And can I tell you that? People sell human souls in the church and in the world. Human trafficking, if you watch that uh, Sounds of Freedom movie, there's, there is so much human trafficking, sex trafficking going on right now today. Right now. Probably in your backyards. You don't realize it. In Bradenton. And you know what you also don't realize? Can I just, I, I know this might offend some people and I don't, do I mean to? I don't mean to offend people. However, it needs to be said. I also think that we're marketing in human souls as well. In the church. Uh, I don't mean necessarily this church, but I'm telling you that they do. And here's how. See, I don't really want to tell you about sin. I don't want to tell you about this judgment. I don't want to tell you the hard things. I don't want to tell you, I just want to tell you the pleasant things, the itching things that your ear wants to hear. You know why? It fills the seats. It brings in the big bucks. It panders to you. Because really, isn't church all about you? Isn't it? Who is it supposed to be about? Is it supposed to be about me? It's supposed to be about Pastor Gary. The school. No, it's all about him. You should be coming here to say, Lord, how can I know you better? How can I see you more clearly? How can I die to self, take up my cross, and follow you daily? That's what I want to do. And not because somebody's making me, because you're good. I want to say, good? Whoa! <laughs> but he is good. Okay, we're going to stop it in a second. Revelation 18, 14 to 16 goes on to say, they will say the fruit you long for is gone from you. All your luxury and splendor has vanished, never to be recovered. Think about that. And here's a good question to ask. 
They will say the fruit you long for is gone from you and all your luxury and splendor, and you're never going to recover it during this time of the tribulation. Here, what fruit do you long for in your life? Like fruit is something that you see. It grows from your life. What fruit do you long for? Well, I want this and I want that. And I want this for myself. I want people to respect me. I want money. I want popularity. I want prestige. I want, I want, I want, I want. Or is the fruit that you long for, unfortunately, these, they were all looking at materialistic stuff, selfish stuff, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the prize of life. But what is the fruit we should look for as Christians? It's the fruit of the Spirit. This is what we should long for, to, to grow love. You should be known primarily by your love. Not that you're perfect, right? Because you're still fleshly, right, sometimes? But people, we should be known by our love we have for one another. Not how well we run the computer. Not how well we sing a song. Not how well we can do the internet or whatever. Are we... Do we have love? Are we growing in peace? Are we growing in patience, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control? Right? These are the fruits of the spirits that we should long for. Lord, help that in us. Let that be my first priority. Amen? And he, closes, he says, the merchants who sold these things and gained their wealth from her will stand afar off, terrified at her torment. They will weep and mourn and cry out, Woe, woe to you, great city dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and glittering with gold and precious stones and pearls. And then he closes with these verses. In Revelation, I'm going to close, 18, 17 to 19. It says, In one hour, such great wealth has been brought to ruin. All that system's going to collapse. Every sea captain, all who travel by ship, all the sailors, all who own their living by the sea and will stand far off, they will see the smoke of her burning. They will exclaim, was there ever a city like this city? They will throw dust on their heads and weep and mourn and cry out, woe to you great city, where all who had ships on the sea had become rich through her wealth. And then it closes out in one hour, she has been brought down to ruin. Look, 1 Corinthians, and I, I don't know, some are like, is this a physical city or a spiritual city? I think it's spiritual, but who knows? Is this America, the commercials? Is it nuclear weapons? We don't know. So for me to jump in and say those things, it's just, I, I don't know, the Bible doesn't say, and so I don't, I'm not going to say it either. But I will tell you that Paul said in 1 Corinthians 7.31, those who use the things of the world should not become attached to them. For this world as we know it will soon pass away. So remember, do not love the world or the things of this world. For when you love the world, you don't have the love of the Father in you. For everything in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but comes from this world. And remember, the world and its desires soon pass away. But whoever does the will of God is going to live how long? Forever. Forever. All right, amen. All right, so would you, uh, gentlemen who or ladies, I don't know who's going to be passing out the, the elements for community. Gary, what time is it? I just need to know how, uh, eight, eight how long have I spoke? Uh, okay, we'll make this, this will be a very short communion. Yeah, start. start passing them out, brother. Start passing them out. I will say this. The Bible does talk about, usually we spend a little bit more time on communion, but I, uh, I had a lot to get through. And I want to say to you guys, listen, if, you, if you're just kind of waking back up, or I know that was a lot of teachy stuff, but that's still good. God's word will never return void. I will tell you this. The Bible says, when we talk about communion, that we are not to eat, listen, or drink in an unworthy manner. In other words, when you take this bread, we're to remember some things about it. 
Do you mind if I grab one too? Is that okay? You think so? Thank you. You're so good. This little matzah, there's a few things that I notice about it. This matzah, this is bread, right? What was that? Unleavened. That's right. There's no yeast in it. And yeast, many times in the Bible, is a symbol for sin. Also, what I know, I don't know if you noticed, uh, that it's, uh, it's got stripes on it. If you notice, and the Bible says, by his stripes, you have been healed. It's also interesting, I don't know if you notice this, once you get it in your hand, you can look at it. There's holes in it. In other words, it's pierced. Jesus was pierced for our transgressions, for all of our iniquities on that cross. The blood of Jesus Christ was shed for you to be saved. That's amazing. For me. So when we take this bread, I, it took a big piece now for demonstration. For, now I'm thinking, <laughs> it's going to be a little, little dry. I hope I can still be able to speak. But when you take this together, I want you to take a minute, just take 30 seconds once it's all handed out, and here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you just to close your eyes and remember the sacrifice. I, I love this cross. We got it actually in Arizona, but it, it's, it's got a little heart on it. I don't know if you can see it so well. And, and that's because God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him wouldn't perish, would have everlasting life. That's not a Christian slogan for a bumper sticker. That's a way to escape the wrath that's a coming. And that's pretty amazing. That's a way to escape the ungodliness, the demonic influence of the world. The only way you will escape is Jesus. The only way. That's it. Otherwise, you're going to be dragged down. It's just the truth. I'm not trying to be mean. I should be the same with me or with everybody else. So when we take this bread together in just a moment, I'm just going to say, you think about what he has done for you. And here's the good, the good news is, if you were the only person on the planet, he would have done it just for you. Now, why would he do that? For a lamb who, who goes astray? Like, I don't know. But he did. And he loves you right now. So when you take this, we'll take a minute. I'm just going to ask you to pray for maybe 30 seconds. Consider his body. He, he said he is the bread of life. So as you take this bread together and pray, think about what he has done for you and is doing for you currently. It's living to make intercession for you now, today, at this second. So take a moment and remember that bread of life as we take it together. And just take a moment and pray and thank him before you do. During the Passover feast that he was celebrating with the disciples, he took the cup, he gave it to his disciples, and he says, drink this. He offered the cup. The cup is a representation of his blood. So by drinking this, you're saying, I want to participate not only in the life you lived, because you're the bread of life, but also, honestly, in the cup of your suffering, and in the redemption by the blood of Jesus Christ.
You're saying, I want to I wanna live for you. That's why don't take it in an unworthy manner. Realize that this was shed for you personally. Not only what he's done, what he's doing now, but listen, your whole future atonement, you already have victory in Christ Jesus because of the blood of the lamb that was shed for you. You don't fight for victory as a Christian. You fight from victory. You are sealed through the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit of God because of the blood of the Lamb. And so as you take that, you say thank you to Jesus. Just take 30 seconds and thank him for the blood that was shed for you. And do that now. Just take it whenever you're ready. I'm going to take a minute and we're just going to pray together. Huh. Okay. Uh, apparently we're going to do one more thing too. So I'm going to pray. But listen, here's what I'd like to do. If there's anyone who needs prayer, I just felt like the Lord was uh, prompting me to do this, so I've never done this before. However, if, so anybody on the prayer team, if you need prayer, uh, uh, raise your hand, and then, okay, raise your hand. I want to look around, everybody. Keep those hands up if you need prayer. I'm going to bow my head, and I'm going to start praying. Everybody who... Look at those people who need prayer. I want to make sure everybody, every person has someone and go pray with them. So leaders, prayer team, whoever, if you just feel led, go over and pray for them. We'll do that now and I'm going to close this in prayer, okay? If you need prayer, raise your hands and other folks, please get up and pray for them. Father, I just pray in Jesus' name, Lord God, for this entire congregation, Lord God, that they would stand strong in the Lord, that they would continue to starve the flesh and feed the spirit of the living God within us, Lord God. I pray that you would do a refining work within us, Lord God. I pray that everyone who has their hand up, even now, Lord God, that you'd be leading someone to go pray for them, Lord God. And if not, I pray they would would come up here afterwards and I would pray for them, Lord God. But everyone would get prayed for, Lord God. Lord, you say... uh, A bruised reed you will not break and a smoldering wick you will not snuff out, Lord. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your power. I thank you for your presence, Lord God. And we ask that in an increasing measure in our life, in our church, in our school, and in our hearts, Lord God. Bless this congregation, Lord. And bless each person specifically who needs prayer, Lord God. Meet their needs specifically, Lord God, in a powerful way. And we ask these things together in the name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said, amen, amen, and amen. Please be praying for people.